safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veteran services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community, and vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Okay, we are gonna call the meeting to order. Good morning, everyone. Please make your way to your seats. Welcome to the Kent County Board of Commissioners meeting for Thursday, March 12th, 2020. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Good morning, Madam Chair. Commissioners Antor. Here. Breevy. Here. Polkowski. Present. Hennessy. Here. Jones. Here. Coleman. Melton. Morgan. Here. Ponstein. Here. Salfeld. Here. Skaggs. Here. Sparks. Present. Vice Chair Steck. Here. Commissioners Talon. Yep. Here. Vonk. Here. Voorhees. Womack. Here. Wooden. Here. Chair Bolter. Here. Madam Chair, you have 16 members present, three absent. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. I'll, we're on to item three, invocation. I'll call on Commissioner Ponstein for the invocation today. Thank Here you, he Chair is. Bolter. Today, I have the honor of yielding my time to Commissioner Buchholz. All right. <laughs> All right. And always be careful what you tell people about your past, since I am seminary trained. Um, we and know to, that. What's that? We know that. Sorry. All right. All right. But it's Catholic, so... Leave it at that, um, so I won't be quoting scripture. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, today we, we chuckle with a little nervousness as our nation and the world, um, a lot of uncertainty, 
surrounding everything. Um, but in a Jewish ceremony, the youngest usually asks, uh, what makes today different than any other day? So every day that um, our staff go out, especially when we think about the sheriff's department, they go out and uncertainty uh, when they knock on doors. Um, our health department, again, what makes today different than any other day as they address things like PFAS and lead and, and now a new thing with a new name. Um, and in this uncertainty, we also celebrate. We give thanks for Commissioner Salfeld and his service. Um, and those of us who will continue on in these seats, but we know he'll, he'll continue to serve elsewhere. So what makes today different than any other day than an opportunity to give thanks, an opportunity to um, seek guidance from each other, from the people next to us, from above, for those of us who believe. So we take a moment to simply say thank you again. What makes today different than any other day than it is a gift, an opportunity, and uh, filled with love. That is my hope and prayer. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioners Bulkowski and Ponstein. Um, if members don't mind, just I want to know toward the end of the uh, agenda, I do want to ask our clerk to give a quick election report, and I also have asked Adam London to be here to give us a quick uh, update on the daily, hourly updates we're getting on uh, COVID-19. So just wanted to note that. Uh, we are on to item five, special order of business. And first we will welcome Steve Curry from the Michigan Association of Counties. You have 10 minutes. All right. Well, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it. One of my roles as executive director is to get around to as many county board meetings as possible in a year. I usually try to do about 40 to 45 county board meetings a, a year. So I appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, I do have a presentation I'm going to run through. There's a lot of information in it. Uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions, or if you'd prefer to wait to the end, I'm fine with that too. So we'll go ahead and get started. Just some general uh, state uh, county information about MAC. Um, you know, we have 16 board members. Of course, Stan Ponstein is currently on the MAC board serving as second vice president. We appreciate that. Uh, Harold Voorhees is a past MAC board member as well. Um, there are two seats from each of the six regions that ensures broad representation. The board meets four times a year. And this uh, fall, we'll have elections in regions one, two, three, five, and an at-large seat. Uh, there are 83 counties, of course, in Michigan, our smallest being Keweenaw County at 2,100 people. Uh, Wayne County has about 1.7 million people, and counties employ about 13.8% uh, uh, people in the state. That ranks us about 42nd in the country. These are some of the state priorities we'll be working on this year as we move through this legislative session. I'll go into more detail in, in upcoming slides. Of course, courts have always been a, a big discussion among counties uh, recently that the, the the Trial Court Funding Commission came out with their recommendations on some changes on how the uh, courts uh, could be funded. Uh, alongside of that, there is a sunset on the fees that courts are allowed to charge to those who use the court system. Uh, right now, it is important to note that that sunsets in October, so we have legislation that is sponsored by uh, 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 Representative Leitner that would ensure those fees could be uh, charged for another three years. Why we try to look at these court funding recommendations to make sure that the courts are, are fully uh, funded because if we don't get that sunset uh, extended, that's a cost of about 200 to 300 million statewide for our, our counties. And this, this slide just emphasizes that. This is from the Trial Court Funding Commission recommendations. Uh, you can see 44% of the cost of the court are funded by locals. Uh, reforming Michigan system of financing local government, as you know, Counties are primarily funded through two mechanisms, property taxes and state revenue sharing dollars. Uh, counties only get statutory revenue sharing, not constitutional like uh, cities, villages, and townships do. So we each year go and uh, have discussions with the legislature on how to ensure that those state revenue sharing dollars are there. Uh, we've been very successful over the past six years in getting increases in revenue sharing dollars. And in this new budget, uh, county revenue sharing dollars were recommended at an increase of about 2.5%. Last year, we got about 2.3%. So while we feel very proud of that, uh, 
Uh, we are also looking at ways of securing that funding better. Is there some sort of uh, funding mechanisms that, that's different? So we're looking at almost putting county revenue sharing dollars in a lockbox that the legislature couldn't appropriate to different uh, things. Uh, are there is, and then we need to look at specific ways of funding county revenue sharing dollars. So these are all discussions that are ongoing. There's actually a, a work group looking at revenue sharing uh, in the legislature right now that we are a part of. Obviously, uh, uh, infrastructure is a big topic of discussion. It has been uh, not limited to just roads, but roads, but also we have shoreline erosion issues. We have PFAS issues. Uh, these are all discussions that Mac have been a, Mac's been a part of uh, when we're talking about shoreline. There has been money appropriated by the governor to uh, uh, help mitigate or, or at least map and look at where these issues are going to be because it's not just a shoreline issue. It's as, actually an inland lake li issue too, or will be this spring when you're talking to uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, some of the weather folks uh, you know the, the, the ground saturated this is going to cause septic issues on inland properties we're already seeing it in Kalamazoo County uh, so we're trying to secure more funding to help mitigate some of that uh, also uh, PFAS is becoming more and more of a topic of conversation so we're trying to secure um, funding to help mitigate some of those uh, contaminated areas uh, and then of course when we're talking about roads so the governor has bonded for 3.5 billion dollars for that only goes towards state roads, and that's important to note. And uh, there has been some legislation introduced to address local roads, one being a local option sales tax and a local, local option registration fee. We do not see much movement on those bills as would allow a county to put a uh, local option gas tax or local option um, registration fee on the on their ballot. Uh, not seeing much traction on that, but just last week, the House did introduce a package of bills that would eliminate the sales tax on gasoline, take that uh, sales tax, move it to uh, excise tax or get the gas tax, and that would put that money towards roads. They also would change the distribution model, so that money would not go through PA 51. It would actually go 60% towards uh, county roads and 40% towards uh, city roads. Um, we are kind of, we're, we're staying out of it right now. We're in discussions about it. We have concerns about it, mainly being because when you talk revenue sharing dollars, that comes out of general fund. If you're eliminating sales tax, there's constitutional revenue sharing that's guaranteed out of that. So now you're putting more pressure on the general fund. And what does that mean towards our revenue sharing? So are we, you know, could we, could we hit a cut from a revenue sharing because more money is going towards roads? That's where the discussions are right now. We're also uh, advocating for a little more money to go towards counties because counties are responsible for 73% of the roads in the state. So uh, those are some of the discussions going on right now. The legislature has indicated that they do want to keep revenue sharing whole. They don't want this to come to a cut of revenue sharing dollars. So we're hopeful that uh, they'll, they'll live up to that and, and kind of solidify that in statute. Mental health, uh, obviously another issue that's been a hot topic late, lately. Um, you know, Max obviously been very involved with it. Many of you on this board have been involved with our staff on it. I know uh, Megan has talked to many of you and you've been very helpful in, in providing feedback to her. Uh, you know, the main thing with mental health is we want to keep it local as much as possible. We want to keep those dollars local. Uh, we want to help our law enforcement as much as possible with diversion pro programs, deflection programs, because many of those that folks that need uh, or have that mental health uh, issue and do end up in our jails and that becomes very costly for our jails and it's not really the right place for them. So we appreciate your help with our uh, org organization on that and our staff on that and we're going to continue to advocate in support of local dollars keeping things local and, and in increasing funding for mental health. Uh, property tax exemptions this is something we're consistently fighting in the legislature. Um, you know, probably the, the one, the most recent one is the disabled veterans property tax exemption. This came at a cost of about $20 million statewide. Uh, of course, we're very supportive of our veterans, but we would prefer it to be a state tax exemption, not a local tax exemption. So one thing we're looking at doing is moving it to a reimbursement from the state. So we would basically say, okay, here are all my property tax exemptions or exemptions that the, the legislature has voted on send that to the state, the state would send a check back to locals to reimburse them for those property taxes. Uh, we, are, we are working with some bill sponsors on that. We do expect introduction of some bills probably in the next month or so on that. And we'll probably use that model going forward. Obviously, opioids are still a hot, hot topic. Uh, there's a lawsuit still going on. Uh, our role in this right now with regards to the, the, the lawsuit is to ensure that any uh, money that would come to the state would funnel down to the locals. If you remember the, the tobacco settlement a few years ago, uh, a lot of that money came to the state and then stopped there. It didn't come down to the locals where the actual costs were occurring. So we want to make sure that any sort of state settlement that comes down, uh, that money fun funnels to locals, local public health, medical examiners, you name it. I mean, it's hitting county budgets in a lot of different areas so we want to make sure that funding comes down to locals 
Uh, deed restrictions, deed restricted properties. This gets at the, the black or the dark stores issue that happened a few years ago. Um, it's still an issue. Uh, there is still a case that's being heard at the tax tribunal. Um, it's uh, City of Escanaba versus Menards. We're waiting to hear a decision on that. That was heard last June. We're expecting a decision hopefully by this June on that. We also have legislation ready to go that looks at deed restrictions, looks at how properties are appraised and assessed. Uh, basically, we want to make sure that if there are deed restrictions on these properties that are causing them to be vacant and then they're using as comparable properties, when we're doing the assessing process, there's some sort of uh, note of that or some sort of accommodation made to, to say, hey, this is a deed restricted property, that's why it's vacant. We can't just value your property the same as that. So uh, we're kind of waiting and seeing to see where the, the court or the tribunal case goes, but we do have legislation ready to go. Uh, four year county commissioner term, something that Max worked on for probably 20 years and this is about the farthest that we've gotten it uh, at this point. We've gotten it out of House Elections Committee. It now sits in House Ways and Means. Um, right now, the disagreement is to when should those county commissioner elections occur? Should it be on a gubernatorial year or should it be on a, a, a presidential term? From the association's perspective, we don't care. We would just like to see county commissioners on four-year terms. That's a, a fight that we're not going to get involved with. We're going to continue to, to advocate for it. Uh, I don't see any movement on that before this summer, probably more of a fall, maybe lame duck issue. But we are one of five states that county commissioners have two-year terms. We think it's a bit ridiculous that county commissioners have to run every two years. And then, of course, uh, the coronavirus response. The federal government has appropriated $8.3 billion for Public health, the state has, uh, in the new supplemental that just came out yesterday, there's some state funding coming for that. Obviously a hot topic of conversation that's very fluid. Uh, from the association's perspective and, and what some of the things we're doing, you know, our association is able to go mobile at any, at any point. Uh, we're encouraging employees that are sick to stay home. We do have a conference coming up uh, in about five weeks uh, that we have not uh, made a decision on. At this point, we're still a go on that. We are gonna continue to watch and see how things go. We're talking to our venues on what some other options options may be, so stay tuned on that. But uh, we are encouraging folks to go to the CDC website and the State of Michigan website, and, and, and I'm sure you guys are in constant contact with your local public health departments as well. Here are policy committees. Many of you already participate on them, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. We thank you for your participation. Jim's been very helpful. Monica participates, obviously. Stan participates. So we, we appreciate all your help there. Just going to skim through these last slides as my time ticks down. There's your MAC team. Dina Bosworth has been Director of Government Affairs for the past 10 years. Megan Kite handles our health and human services and judiciary issues. And if you ever have a question and you don't know where to go, you can contact Michael and he will point you in the right direction. And he also handles our uh, um, um, environmental issues. Like I mentioned, we do have our conferences coming up. Uh, the April conference is going to be in Lansing. Our August conference is in Kalamazoo. We have, we have a variety of programs we also participate in, uh, with. This is our communication tools. We do Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We've got a podcast. Hopefully you're getting our weekly updates. We've got an every other month newsletter. So we're trying to give you as much information as possible and we appreciate your help and support of the organization. It's probably the fastest I've done that presentation. That, that was awesome, good job. <laughs> we like to keep it to 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, any questions for Steve today? Questions, comments, concerns, uh, Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had one quick question. Thank sure. you again for the update. Um, regarding the commissioner for your term uh, discussion, has there been any discussion about uh, tacking any electoral changes to also reforming how commission lines are drawn? Uh, I only say this because Proposal 2 uh, passed pretty overwhelmingly both here in Kent County and across the state. And by my knowledge, this is one of the few bodies that doesn't have a similar process because it's baked in statute. Mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion about trying to, to marry that only because, you know, I think, you know, the voters have sent us a clear message that this is something they care about? Yeah, not, not in, alongside of this legislation, there hasn't been any discussion about it. I'd have to go to our general government platform to see if there's anything in there about how county uh, uh, commissioner lines are drawn, but nothing in regards to alongside of this legislation. It's strictly been looking at terms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bukowski. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for being here. Um, quick theoretical question. You sure. know, how, how is that challenge trying to, you know, meet the needs of a Keweenaw County with 2,000 folks versus a Wayne County or us Kent County kind of in the middle. Um, yeah, how, how are you pulled? 
And how do you keep it together? Yeah, it, it is a challenge at times. I mean, there's often an, an urban rural, you know, butting of heads. Um, you know, when you come to, when it comes to county commissions, you know, it, you'd be amazed to hear about the challenges that you folks face here. They often are facing in Keweenaw County, you know, funding for public health, mental health issues. I mean, it's, it, it does, it's very similar. Uh, when you get into, you know, distribution models and things like that, you know, that does put us into some tough positions. And, you know, we, we try to do the, the best we can as an association that's re representing small and large. But, uh, you know, a lot of times, the, the, you know, I would say the majority of issues do, you know, translate between counties. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Steve. Morning. I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge you and Megan for all your hard work in stepping to the plate in the uh, in the mental health arena. Thanks. Uh, this is an area that, it, it, based on our conversations with Megan yesterday and folks from the department, that um, the state's going to leave the local entities to sort of redesign from the ground up. And if we're going to be competing with the private health plans, uh, we encourage MAC to play a bigger and bigger role in helping us coalesce that conversation because it's going to be a it's going to be difficult. So, well, I appreciate that, and and really the credit goes. Megan is great on this issue. I mean, she is uh, she's been with us for about two years now, and she's really jumped in with both feet and really understands the issue better than anyone in our organization. So I appreciate that comment, and I appreciate your help and and your guys's impact. I know you and, and Jim's been obviously very uh, helpful in a lot of that too. So thank you, Commissioner Skiggs. Thank you, Chair. I want to continue the, the line from Commissioner Wooden. Um, I just, I, I think Mac ought to really make this a, a priority to deal with the gerrymandering that continues to go on in counties. Um, I think the voters have clearly spoken. They haven't spoken about four-year terms for county commissioners. I doubt that there's anyone except people sitting up at this podium that have any concern about whether we have two or four-year terms on the county. But we do know that millions and millions of Michiganders decided that they didn't think it made sense for politicians to draw their own lines. And yet it seems from your answer that you're telling me that Mac is not making this at all a priority. Well, I mean, um, our, and our, if I could finish my question, sure. that'd be great. I think it's, um, I, I think this is something that you should make a priority. We have party elected officials, members of parties, not even elected officials, party county chairs making decisions about the lines and counties. And I think it's unconscionable. I think it's, it's a ridiculous system and I think it needs to change. I think it's far more higher priority to make county government more effective than four year terms. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the way we kind of develop our platforms and our priorities are through our committee process. So if you'd like to come to our general government committee and, and discuss that, we'd you'd be more than happy to have, it's in the the, the uh, presentation on when they meet, you're more than happy, we're more than happy to have you come in and discuss it and discuss it with that committee and then we can bring it up through the board through that process. That's how our process works on that. It's not, I don't make the decision on what positions we take, it's our organization and that's how we do it there. Okay, any follow up, Commissioner Skiggs? No. Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. What a great segue. I more wanted to make a comment, which is um, how much I've learned and appreciated being on a couple of the, the MAC committees um, and want to encourage uh, my colleagues to, um, to be involved. <coughs> we both learn, and one of the things I've learned is how much our legislative folks at MAC um, put into how much work they do on our behalf. It's pretty incredible. So I, I want to add my compliments about that and and um, recommend that if you can find the time you can you can participate in these meetings remotely um, which is very helpful for for many people who aren't semi-retired like me um, so uh, those comments thank you commissioner Womack yes Steve I want to thank you for all your work and especially when we have these Mac conventions and all the work I see you putting it into it and everybody that's on those committees. Uh, when it comes to the gerrymandering, my question is, are there any specific committees someone should um, focus on or be a part of if they want to uh, bring up the issue of gerry gerrymandering? 
is in my community it has been real stifling. Um, the gerrymandering that went on the last couple of decades. So I, I do think it's an important issue. Um, so I just wanted to know what specific committees people should focus on if they want to get more involved in bringing some of those issues to the light. Yeah, it'd be our general government committee. Um, and you don't have to actually be on the committee to bring an issue up in there. You right. can just call in. You see when they meet, we can uh, just contact our office if you want to just call in, or you can just show up at our office and actually, uh, you know, just discuss the issue with our with our uh, committee members. Yeah. And, and, and when we bring commissioners together uh, nationally, as some of the conventions we do nationally, would we be able, uh, from our Michigan MAC board, be able to get those issues more focused on nationally also? How would we go about doing that? Yeah, so those would be done through NACO, National Association of Counties. It, they have their own committee structure as well. Right. If you'd like to sit on one of those committees, uh, I can we, we can get you put on one of those committees or at least apply, and then they would make the decision ultimately. But nine times out of ten, you would be put on there as long as they have certain rules, the number of county commissioners from certain counties and certain states. But, um, yeah, that would be done through NACO, and we can help with that as well. You just reach out to us and we can help you with that. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, like I said, keep up the good work and I, I really respect you coming in here today, giving us this great presentation and update, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Sparks. Thank you for being here, Mr. Curry. Um, I have to echo the sentiments of Commissioner Talon and it does not take a lot of time to actually serve on these uh, committees. I'm on three, the Agriculture and Tourism the general and the immigration task force with Commissioner uh, Talon and the information that we learned is so vi valuable and viable to what we do. So I really appreciate Mac being a new commissioner uh, it has really helped me to have a, more of a platform to understand how to serve better. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Four years, please. <laughs> Any other questions for Steve? Right, commissioner Antor. Real quickly. That was an incredible presentation. Under the gun, you got through a lot of information. It's one of the best presentations ever. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. There you go. <laughs> Anything else for Steve? I just have a personal compliment to Dina and Megan because I, I know how hard they work. A, usually association um, advocates have the luxury of focusing on a couple issues and a couple committees, and these two individuals have to track every single issue that could be in a county and they do it just amazingly well so i just want to compliment and 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 you as well but but i know <laughs> no, dina and megan <laughs> no I, I agree i agree so, I'll, I'll pass that along thank great. you thank you so much and thank you for your presentation today thank you all right we are on to 5b treasurer's annual investment report and i will call up our treasurer ken parish Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for putting the pressure on there, Commissioner Antor. Best presentation ever. <laughs> Way to go, Steve. Uh, it's my honor to be before you again this year to present the annual investment report. Um, uh, as I do every year, I touch on uh, a couple things related to it. Uh, the first, uh, the, ne the next slide uh, is the annual quiz. I operate uh, under the slide principle. Who can tell me what the slide principle is? Safety, liquidity, and yield. I heard a good from this side of the room. This side, you got to work on it. Uh, but that is correct. Uh, safety, liquidity, and yield in that order. Uh, I'm proud to say that in 23 plus years, our money has always been safe. We've never lost a penny. Uh, liquidity, we've always made payroll. That's, that's, my, that's my benchmark. And, and, and yield, uh, that is uh, really up to uh, the winds of change right now. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit further. Uh, but uh, uh, you all have been presented with a, with a written report of this. Um, but uh, 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 this is the, the report that I show you. Uh, I make it, break down the funding into uh, three basic sections. Uh, first is governmental, uh, governmental, and those, in, in this case, they're all federal governmental funds, uh, $49 million. 
uh, pooled or other type funds, and there are two specific pool funds that we are, have participated in for many years. Uh, one is called the Class Investment Pool, and one is uh, My Laugh. Uh, both uh, uh, top-rated pools. We have about 42 million uh, split between those pools. Then we have uh, uh, certificates of deposit and money market. And uh, you'll see we have quite a list of, of uh, institutions that we uh, have money invested in. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, some are larger, some are smaller. Uh, you'll see that the dollar amounts uh, roughly correlate to the size of the of the uh, entities uh, in the first column after the uh, name of the institution you'll see a number uh, with a star for example Bank of America five star uh, <clears throat> I look to uh, a, a company called Bauer uh, ratings uh, for their uh, rating of financial institutions uh, with five being the highest rating uh, and in your packet, you do have uh, the uh, description of the various uh, levels uh, that they and, and what goes into that rating system. Um, all but one uh, of the banks and credit unions that we deal with are uh, in the excellent or superior rating. Uh, we do have one that is uh, in the good. Uh, rating, so it's still an, a fine institution, um, but uh, uh, you'll see also that um, uh, we do look to the size of the bank to determine how much uh, should be invested with them, uh, because basically I don't want Kent County to be the biggest depositor in any one institution. Uh, uh, but uh, on the flip side, um, if they do business in Kent County, uh, I, I want to work with them uh, as best we can. So, uh, so as you see, there's 20, I think 24, 25 on the list, uh, including um, uh, currently we're working with one credit union, uh, Consumers uh, Credit Union. So we have uh, $287 million in those CDs and money market funds. And then uh, the, the final item is cash and bank. Those are the amounts that are in the myriad of checking accounts as of 1231. So that our, our total pool of investments is $386,500,000. Uh, and then for investment income, uh, uh, the general fund earned $2.1 million in, in uh, investment income. Uh, this year, and the total pool earned about $8.4 million. So we'd been seeing a slow but steady increase in rates over the last couple of years. Um, um, uh, first, uh, this is just a pie chart version uh, of, what, uh, of where those funds are. According to state statute, uh, uh, exclusive of uh, governmental uh, 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 securities, we're not allowed to have more than 25% in any one institution. Uh, as you see here, um, the uh, largest uh, single uh, amount that we have in any institution is at Bank of America, and that's only 10% of the pool. So we're well under statutory requirements on that. Um, but as I was saying about interest rates, um, the, our pool earned uh, in December of 2019 uh, was earning 2.1%. Uh, I, I pulled out um, two weekly, we get weekly uh, uh, rate, what are called rate sheets from many of the institutions, and I found one bank that had sent us a rate sheet on March 2nd. And their one-year CD at that point was paying 1.5%, 1.50. One week later, March 9th, their one-year CD rate was 0.55%. Dropped almost a full percentage point in one week. So I think, uh, I guess my message is, uh, given the current uncertainty in the financial markets, 
uh, I, I would be I would bet against seeing $2 million going into the general fund in 2020. Uh, we'll certainly do what, I, what we can, uh, but again, following the slide principle, we have to make sure our money is safe and that it is available to us when we need it. So um, I, I guess it's just kind of a, a forewarning for you that it, it's a very uncertain uh, market for uh, uh, fixed income funds right now. Uh, next up uh, is in, several years ago, uh, Commissioner Talon asked us, well, where, where within county government is all this money? And so I, I look at, I put together this uh, little spreadsheet showing, uh, and this is, again, a, a reminder, this is all cash. It's not fund balances. It's the cash on hand in these particular funds. But as you can see, the largest funds are uh, solid DPW solid waste disposal, the general fund, and then third is the local government per portion of our pooled fund. So those are uh, 270 uh, plus million of the 386 million. Uh, so, um, and then a lovely pie chart that shows you the same thing. Oh. Any questions? Two minute, uh, almost two minutes to spare. Uh, well, you know, I, work. I know I'm so going to get at least one question. I always do. All right, Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Chair. That was a really nice job. Thank you. <laughs> really nice job. Um, the 2.5% we were getting, is that a cumulative or is that like, how do each one of the institutions stack up against each other on what interest rate? Are they all pretty similar? They're, they're all, the institutions that we deal with are all pretty much within a pretty, pretty close range. Um, there are some uh, well-known big banks that uh, choose not to uh, be competitive in the CD market or fixed income market because that's just not how they fund their operation and their business. So, um, uh, you know, that bank right over there, uh, their rates have been traditionally significantly lower, so we haven't had money with them. Um, but uh, in general, uh, the banks are uh, in, in a pretty tight range of, of rates. Uh, the one I mentioned is just as, uh, illustrative of what's happening in the market. Um, but uh, uh, we have CDs. Uh, we're in the CD market all the time. So we're always rolling CDs over. Uh, and so the individual interest rates are all over the map. But we have a rather sophisticated computer system that helps us to determine uh, what our uh, current rate would be. So, okay. thank you, Kevin. Commissioner Bolkowski. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Kevin, uh, for your report. Um, my semi-annual questions along the lines of, you know, I, I know this is about investment. However, the flip side of this coin is um, what we pay in interest. And are, is there as much movement on the interest we pay side of life as there is, as you just pointed out, you know, over a week there's a percentage point drop in what we earn. But, you know, for example, in a few minutes we might approve, um, you know, a significant amount of borrowing. It is only for a year or two, but still, you know, but do those rates move as fast? Yes, the, those rates in particular do move very quickly. Um, and uh, uh, I know that the, uh, the, the borrowing rates have, have been coming down for the last several months as well. As I said, we were at a 2.1 in December. We're, you know, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, we were at one and a half. Those rates are also uh, fluctuating even more so. Uh, the 10-year Treasury note uh, dropped below well, 1%, which is unheard of. Right. And it's down, I guess it's down close to 0.5 or 0.6. 0.4. 0.4. If you so, yes, that does rate. definitely impact uh, the, the rates that, that we will see on that borrowing. I expect that we'll get uh, very favorable rates. And favorable would be uh, in the range of, again, not holding you to it. 
Uh, well, last year we paid what two about two percent, two and a quarter. Uh, I would I would guess we'll be in the one and a half range here, maybe right. lower. Okay. Again, wild guess, but right. Okay. Somewhat educated. So. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. I was trying to remember, being the the newbie on the Finance Committee, when it comes to the investment income that we do put into our budget, the money is it anticipatory investment income when we budget like we have with anticipatory taxes, or are we using the investment income from last year for the 2020 budget? I'm, I'm more just wondering if if the current uncertainty in the market yields a lower than expected investment, um, will that affect this year's budget or next year's budget? It could potentially affect the 2020 budget. Okay. Um, we, do, I, I, we do look at uh, what the trends have been, and the trend had been increasing. Mm -hmm. So um, that budget number is probably higher than where we're going to end up. Um, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much that would be. Thank you. Commissioner Melton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going back to the pie chart on page six, and just probably, well, I don't know if anyone else knows, but I don't have a, a understanding. I'm not back a little more. Um, can county investments as, okay, what is pooled in other funds? Can, can you help me understand that, please? Pooled and other funds. Those are uh, the uh, second grouping on the, on the report. Uh, those are uh, uh, essentially, in our case, two uh, uh, managed pool funds that are managed by uh, uh, national organizations, but the pools are specific to the state of Michigan. Okay. So they have to meet all Michigan requirements uh, for public fund uh, investment. Um, so, as I said, they're the the two names are class and my laugh. Uh, but the, again, those are liquid, and that goes back to the liquidity issue. Um, we can get our money out of these uh, uh, any day, every day we need to. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Ken today? Did you have another? Uh, yeah, one more, one more thing, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for that. Uh, after six terms in office as your county treasurer, I have decided that six terms is enough. I am announcing that I will not seek re-election to the office of Kent County Treasurer, nor will I seek any other elected position this year. After seeing my name on 20 primary and general election ballots, I'm looking forward to not seeing it in August. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, and obviously thank you for your service, and we will have you back for whatever cake and ice cream or whatever we need to do. But Well, if there's cake, I'll be here. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for your update as well. Thank you so much. All right, we are on to item six, public comment related to the agenda. Do we have any public comment today regarding agenda items? All right, seeing none, we are on to item seven, consent agenda, and I will call on Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mike Paul. Consent agenda for the state. Moved by Commissioner Ponstein, support, support by Commissioner Sparks. Questions or comments on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, this is a roll call. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion to adopt the consent agenda, Commissioners Antor. Yes. Breevy. Yes. Polkowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Belton. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Voorhees. <clears throat> Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 18 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. The consent agenda is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We are on to 8A, the, uh, and I'll call on Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair Bolter. I move for adoption resolution 24 of today's date, the purchase of develop, development rights selection criteria for 2020. Moved by Commissioner Talon. Support. So support by Commissioner Wooden. Questions or comments? All right, seeing none, this is not a roll call. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? 
motion passes. We are on to 8B, and I'll call on Commissioner Bonk. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll move resolution number 25 of today's date, front of the Court Citizens Advisory <laughs> Committee appointment. Moved by Commissioner Bonk, support, support by Commissioner Brevey. Questions or comments? All right, seeing none, this is again not a roll call. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Resolution passes. We are on to 8C. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Resolution 26. It's from the Treasurer's Office as delinquent 2019 real property taxes and to authorize the general obligation limited tax notes uh, 2020. Moved, moved by Commissioner Morgan, support by Commissioner Vaughn. Questions or comments? All right, seeing none, this is a roll call. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> On the motion to adopt Resolution 312 2026. Commissioners Antor. Yes. Freeby. Yes. Bukowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Melton. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Bonk. Yes. Voorhees. Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 18 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 312 2026 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're on to the back of our agenda. Number nine, public comment on any county matter. Do we have any public comment today related to any county matter? Come on up if we do. Welcome to the Kent County Board of Commissioners. Please state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sidney Deans. Um, I live at 843 Dickinson Street South. Oh, uh, 2642 Swansea Place. <laughs> I just moved. Um, what I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, what I call truce. Um, I'm, uh, this city, just like, uh, you know, every other county and city in, in Michigan, and matter of fact, all over in, um, all over the United States has been set up to the way to which there's two bodies, the city and the county. The thing about it is, if you look at your homes, your homes are set up, you know, uh, you, you each, there's a man, there's a woman or whatever, you know, you're working together to see that the family is taken care of correctly. Now, um, any threats coming along to the family, you take your, your whatever, whatever revenues you have, you put it into that to, you, to, to, you know, to get rid of this, this problem. The thing about it is, is that um, the city and the county is like two people in one house. You're taking care of the same people. Their better welfare is, it tops over everything what happens. Their better welfare. Now, uh, when, I'm, when I look at their better welfare, uh, uh, what the county, the city, or whoever is putting out in, the, in, in Grand River, the uh, 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 waste treatment plant, that is poisoned. It's not being strained properly. Uh, the, the, uh, life forms is being released into the water, which does not belong in, in, in the quantity in the river, the way, the way they are today. Because they are affecting the fish, they're causing sores on the fish, they're eating on the fish. Um, now, uh, there's this, uh, there's these life forms that is uh, going out in there is, is a deadly uh, body which could really bring harm to individuals if taken internally. And ask any one of those people to work out there, they will tell you they, they would not be good to enter into the body. How can you get them out? How can you get this out of a child's body? How can you get this out of a child's body? Uh, who have went out there, uh, in Lake Michigan, Grand Haven, that water goes, that water comes out the Grand River and then swirls around. There's people out there playing, enjoying themselves in this, in this lake. Some of these life forms, you know, 
Have you ever been choked by water swimming? <clears throat> Some of this can get in you. It can really cause you a, 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 a very, Thank very you. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Your, your three minutes is up for today. You have a conclusion? Thank you so much for coming. All right. Any other public comment today? Seeing none, we are on to commissioner reports. Do we have any specific reports today? Commissioner Breeby? Thank you, Chair Bolter. I have a couple here. Um, first, the West Michigan Sports Commission. We had a meeting yesterday, and we um, announced our annual luncheon, which is now going to be an annual dinner. <laughs> and we have um, Jack Nicholas coming to speak on Tuesday, June 23, at um, 5 p.m. at uh, the DeVos Place. If you're interested in tickets, I'd be happy to help you head to the right direction, but it's going to be a great event, and um, it's a fundraiser with donations going to the Sports Commission, uh, the Nicholas Children's Hospital and Fund, and then um, the American Dunes Golf Club. There's um, something going on with that, too. So I would definitely recommend everybody attending. It's awesome and a great fundraiser. So the next thing I have, too, is um, the NACO. I got to attend that with a couple of my colleagues here. It's always a great time in Washington, D.C., um, talking about, you know, what is affecting our counties and meeting with other county officials. And I had the opportunity to hear from uh, some folks from, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the county. It was in Minnesota, and they talked a lot about trash in their recycling program. So I have some really good insights on that. And overall, we had some really great speakers, Colin Powell, was one of them. We heard from our president. So, and, um, you know, it was an interesting time and got to communicate with lots of um, local officials. So it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. The Grand Rapids DDA met yesterday and two things I want to share with you. One is um, we uh, consented to participate in what's called an OPRA. Uh, it's a tax abatement for um, obsolete properties. And this is for a project on the corner of Godfrey and Market, uh, kind of a warehouse building with, has a bunch of offices in it right now. Um, interesting project, about 150 apartments will be going in there. It's a developer from Chicago who's sticking their feet into the Grand Rapids investment water, which I find interesting. The second is um, funding for what is being called a temporary skate and bike park uh, downtown on that property along the river where one of our parcels uh, was purchased by the city. Um, it will be eventually <coughs> developed for a park uh, along the river as the river restoration happens. But um, for the next couple of years, it's going, a piece of that will be used for a bike and skate park. So it's kind of a, it's something that's been in process for a long time and uh, kind of exciting that that's finally coming to fruition. Thank you. Commissioner Bukowski. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the Front of the Court Advisory Committee met a week ago Monday. Um, I thank Commissioner Walmack who came out for that. Um, this was, as I noted before, the meeting where the previous task force was invited to come and um, continue to, to get good news from, um, you know, the work that is being done by our deputies out in the field. Um, so the concerns, again, that, that citizens brought forward, um, continue to be addressed and, and positively. And again, thanking Commissioner Lanier from next door, who suggested we all get together to review that. So again, great work by the friend of the court and the um, sheriff and her staff to continue to be as, um, be as much of service as possible in those trying times when you have support issues out there and warrants and all that stuff occurring. So we continue to do good things and continue to strive to do them better. Any other official reports today? All right, we are going to move on to number 11. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Oh, I thought it was waiting. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Did you have a report? No report. Just, okay. Just All right, I'm going to move on to item 11 on our agenda, which is a recognition of our departing fellow commissioner. So I'm going to go to the actual over to the podium and then I'm going to I won't make you stand there with me the whole time. Okay? I won't make you come down here at some point. Can everyone hear me okay? 
I just wanted to recognize our departing Commissioner Selfeld today. This is his last board meeting, and um, he has many accomplishments, but some of them that I want to quickly highlight in his time as chair, this isn't over his whole time as commissioner, but we did whittle it down to his time as chair. And these aren't all of them. These are just some of them. Um, but he did launch the agribusiness work group. He was very involved in dispatch, not only getting our um, dispatch surcharge in place to get us all on the same radios, but also he worked with the city of Wyoming to get that contract in place, which is very important. Again, showing collaboration within our county. He launched the Front of the Court Engagement Task Force, which we are still working on. He launched the Lead Task Force, which we are um, launching our 2.0. Um, the Museum and Zoo Millage Switch, Intergovernmental Services, uh, West Michigan Partnership for Children, which we heard a lot about. That, was, that started under Jim's leadership here at the county. Um, we appointed our, our uh, administrator under Jim's leadership. And... Um, we also maintained our bond rating, and we continued to balance our budget. So those are some of the highlights. And then quickly, Jim, we have a proclamation from the county. We have a picture of all of us for you to remember. <laughs> I don't know if you want to keep it. Um, I, I had asked for your, your chair uh, photo, but apparently you already have one. So anyway, we're, we're giving Jim a picture of all of us. And then lastly, I think sometimes we, we come here and we, we all meet and we're all busy. And sometimes we don't know about the lives of, of each one of you know We don't know each other real well. So I did ask the legislature to put together a uh, tribute. And if you'll indulge me, I want to read it because it does, does talk about Jim's accomplishments and his life in general. So if you'll give me another couple minutes. Um, let it be known that we wish to join with the Kent County Board of Commissioners in expressing our appreciation to Commissioner Jim Sawfeld for his many years of exemplary service to the people of Kent County. Born and raised in Nebraska by Richard and Hazel Sawfeld, Jim went on to receive his bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska and his law degree from Northwestern University Law School. His professional career moved him to Kent County, Michigan, where he worked in various legal roles, including in-house counsel for Bissell and Meritage Hospitality Group, an associate with Dyke and Magasset Law Firm, and a co-founder of the Sawfeld and Stewart Law Firm. In addition to his legal work, in 2016, Jim became the CEO of Church Extension Fund, a $260 million fund that provides financing for congregations, schools, and entities of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Michigan. Jim began his work in public service by being appointed to the Grand Rapids Township Planning Commission in 2004 and was later elected to the Grand Rapids Township Board of Trustees, serving from 2007 to 2011. Following his time on the Township Board, Jim was elected as a Republican to the Kent County Board of Commissioners in 2010 and was elected four times, representing approximately 35,000 residents of Ada, East Grand Rapids, and Grand Rapids Township. During his time on the 19-member commission, Jim chaired both the standing committees of the board, finance and legislative, and from 2013 to 15, Jim was elected by his colleagues to serve as vice chair, and 2016 to 18 as board chair. Jim also chaired two community task forces, the Community Collaboration Work Group and the Agribusiness Community Work Group. He also served as chair to, of the Kent Hospital Finance Authority and served as a member of the Kent County Pension Board, the Kent Ottawa Muskegon Foreign Trade Zone Board, and the Kent Officers Compensation Committee. Beyond his role as county commissioner, Jim was also appointed by the governor to serve on the Michigan Higher Education Facilities Commission from 2001 to 2006. In addition to his professional and public service career, Jim volunteers with various philanthropic and community organizations. He currently serves on the board of directors of Northwestern University Alumni Club of West Michigan and is a board member of the Arthritis Foundation of West Michigan. Jim also serves as a hearing panelist for the Attorney Discipline Board of the Michigan Supreme Court and served on the District Charter and Fitness Committee of the Michigan Bar Association. In addition, he also serves on the Grand Rapids Township 
Economics Development Corporation Board and is a past member of the Grand Valley Metro Council. In 2002, Jim was recognized by his alma mater, receiving the University of Nebraska Young Alumni Achievement Award. In special tribute, therefore, this is offered to Commissioner Jim Soffold on recognition of his many years of dedicated and thoughtful service to the citizens of Kent County. And so I present this to you, Commissioner. Thank you. In case, do you have a couple of things there? Oh, yeah, sure. sure. And there's Kate. So I'll continue. No, I, uh, Mandy covered what I've done in the past, and it's been a great ride. Um, you know, uh, Ken announced he, he's not running again, and you kind of know when that time comes. And I knew, and I'd already told several of you that I was not running again this year. What I didn't know until a couple months ago was that I'd have to uh, bow out early. And... The reason why is I just would have ended up starting to miss too many meetings. But uh, it's been a, a good time. And, um, you know, I want to especially recognize um, some people, um, uh, Roger and Ted and Harold Voorhees, Carol and Tom, who have all been around since I started, uh, and in particular Ted. Ted is the quintessential commissioner. Uh, he's, he's a good man. I, w I wish all of us were like him, but uh, it's it's been it's been a, a very good time. And uh, hey, I look forward. <clears throat> I n noticed, and I had uh, as you know, I'm moving. I'm moving to Washtenaw County, where my work is in Ann Arbor. I didn't know until very recently. I, I did buy a home there, and I happened to look, and lo and behold, it's in the one county commission district that usually leans right. <laughs> so when I went through the house with my uh, mover, this was before I realized that, he said, do you want to keep all those political signs? And I said, yeah, let's just keep them. <laughs> it's probably a good idea I did that. So who knows, maybe one day I'll be a commissioner at another county. But uh, no, it's great serving with all of you. Uh, nothing but the, but the best. Uh, keep up the good work. And uh, we, we, Kent County's always known for fiscally sound uh, decisions and good services just keep that up thank you thank you all right and we didn't shed any tears um, we are on to number 12 miscellaneous but before that um, if you don't mind and you'll indulge me a little bit more I would like to get a quick update from the clerk on um, election and then I did want to call Adam London up to give us a quick update on uh, COVID-19. Thank you Madam Chair. <clears throat> we did have an election on Tuesday. It was the first countywide election that we've had since Proposal 3 took effect from 2018 um, and I'm pleased to report that all in all it went very very smoothly. It was um, it was a good election especially as we're getting prepared um, our local municipalities get prepared for the big one in November and the um, almost as big one in August. We had 30% turnout um, on Tuesday, countywide, 145,923 voters. Um, we had 1,009 individuals um, went and registered to cast their ballot, registered to vote uh, on the same day, which was part of Proposal 3. That is testing our infrastructure immensely um, throughout the county, um, but we'll see how it goes going forward. Um, our locals were, were um, prepared to handle it. We had 55,180 uh, voters cast an absentee ballot this, this election. That is actually down from, down from the November um, city elections last year, but it was 37.8% which is a 125% increase of absentee voters over the 2016 presidential primary in March. Um, we are con continuing the canvas that began yesterday at 1 o'clock. We have two new canvassers, um, and they're, they're meeting the challenge head on. They're doing a really great job. And this year, <clears throat> this year we are... Um, in my office, I'm implementing um, new provisions allowed to me by the state to ensure that we're able to con to um, complete the canvas within our statutory time frame. So we have um, we're bringing in assistance as well. We have two 
this time around um, just to get our feel for having assistant canvassers uh, or assistant clerks work the canvas um, in preparation for having to hire, uh, bring more people on as well in November. So that's going really well as in addition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Adam, do you mind giving us a quick update? And, and, I, and I would like to allow questions if anyone has a couple. Sure. Good morning, everyone. And I'll preface everything I'm going to say with uh, the, the disclaimer that this is a highly fluid situation. And whatever I say now may be <laughs> totally different uh, by the time you get home. Uh, you know, across the U.S. right now, we've got about 1,500 diagnosed cases of COVID-19 there. I think there's 39 deaths now in Michigan. You know we have two confirmed cases, one in Oakland and one in Wayne County. Um, with 1,500 cases nationally, you may wonder, well, why do we only have two in Michigan? And that is largely because the testing is woefully insufficient right now. And we know that the virus is here. It's in our community. Um, that's that's a reality that that we need to be prepared for, and we need to be, you know we need to accept that now it is here amongst us, <laughs> and uh, and so it's very important that uh, we continue to be vigilant in our work to uh, to exercise good sanitation and to protect ourselves and our neighbors, especially those who are the most vulnerable, being the uh, the elderly and those with underlying health conditions. Uh, here in Kent, thus far. We have monitored uh, 24 people with a history to an affected, an affected nation. Uh, nine of them are still currently in, uh, in quarantine. Uh, however, I want to again emphasize those are not sick people. Those are people that because of their travel history, uh, they are under surveillance. We also have, uh, have 11 uh, tests that are pending at the state laboratory of people who are sick. They may be sick with COVID. They probably are not sick. Uh, we've received nine tests back uh, so far that have been negative for COVID-19. We're working very closely with our hospitals, with our health care providers, with our schools, our long-term health care facilities, uh, the media, uh, and of course the media uh, in, in every way is looking for information for us, and that's been a full-time job as well. And uh, we're trying our best to keep the information on Access Kent current. And I certainly encourage everyone to follow Access Kent for, for information. Also, if you would, uh, please continue to follow and like our, our Facebook. That's, that's the easiest way for us to speak directly to the community because we don't have to rely on the media to carry our message for us. So whatever you can do to encourage your constituents to follow our Facebook page helps us greatly. Uh, we've seen a, a huge increase in followers of our website. Uh, I think Steve Kelso said that we're seeing 80 to 100,000 people that are they're engaging in some way with our post every day. So that's encouraging. Um, I'll stop there and entertain any questions you may have. Questions? Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, a comment. Um, I've been tracking them myself and trying to disseminate as much as possible, and I found it incredibly helpful. And thank you for all your hard work on this. Um, my first question was regarding testing. Um, you mentioned that we're woefully behind on this. I know that the state, at least, was discussing a uh, $25 million appropriation. Is testing involved in that appropriation? And um, what other means can be done to ensure that we, we get our testing up to par so that we can get a better handle of this outbreak? Yeah, so I, I believe uh, part of that includes uh, an improvement to, to laboratory resources uh, and, and staffing uh, therein. Uh, the challenge is that you know, we don't have enough test kits. We still don't. Yeah. You know, we, we, we know that they're on the way. Uh, last update I had is that we have uh, 300 in the state of Michigan. Uh, that was uh, as of last Friday. Many of those have been used over the course of the last five days. Uh, I know more are on the way. Uh, but testing is uh, ideally should have been one of the primary tools we were using in this phase. We're going to quickly get to a point where testing is really no longer practical or useful, where there is enough community-wide transmission that uh, trying to identify individual cases is going to become impractical. Um, if, if I may. Sure. Um, th I also uh, saw through 
both the health department's email and I also through uh, Grand Rapids Public Schools email that you're coordinating with our public schools to limit large groups, but you know we haven't yet reached a more aggressive phase. Uh, I also know that several employers are already talking about working from home and trying to find ways to uh, have virtual offices for the time being. Has the health department uh, had any in, uh, any conversations with our larger employers in influencing that, or have there been conversations with the chamber to see if we can find ways to, uh, when feasible, have folks work from home uh, so that we can limit the we can have that social. Uh, I forgot how it's called. Distancing. Dis yeah. so social distancing. Thank you. Uh, y yes, we have, and we have the, the CDC guidance for businesses that we have been pushing uh, as broadly as possible, trying to get employers, and everyone's situation is different in what they do, who they employ, the service they provide, but thinking creatively within their own means for how they can uh, work leanly uh, and try to protect their employees and their customers. Uh, in regard to the schools, if I could... Uh, follow up on that a little bit. Uh, early on in this response, especially in the western states, the, the, the game plan was a, a student or a faculty member is sick, we close the school down for 14 days. We're now starting to learn that that may be the worst thing we can do with the primary and secondary schools because what happens when we do that, the kids leave the school, they still continue to congregate, and so we really haven't stopped much of that uh, that contact. They're a very low risk group to begin with, mm -hmm. uh, but then they also, they need care. <laughs> and so in many cases they're being uh, sent to grandma and grandma's house and that's the high risk group. Yeah. So they also, they need, they need meals. Many families rely on the schools for meals. There's a number of reasons why we're thinking now that closing a school for 14 days as, <coughs> as the immediate response is not a great strategy. Our plan as of this moment is if we were notified of a positive test for a student or a teacher would be close the school for one day, that gives us an opportunity to investigate, learn who the close contacts were, maybe do a targeted, limited quarantine of those people, gives us a day to disinfect the school, uh, and then to decide, uh, do we reopen the school? Uh, how do we move on in order to limit the impact on families? Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Good morning, Adam. Um, Good morning. My question is more from the uh, provider aspect of this, ambulance providers and EMS providers, fire departments, first responders. Um, we have an inventory of personal protection equipment uh, that is woefully inadequate for what we think is going to happen here. And um, our suppliers are like three, four, five, six weeks out on some of this stuff. Is there any kind of uh, discussion on how we can get some of this PPE equipment to the first responders that are going to be on the front lines of this. Um, the national weakness. Yeah. It, it's a, it's uh, similar to the test kits. In fact, I, I was talking to Bill Heisinger a couple of days ago and encouraging him to, uh, and then all of our leaders in Washington to recognize this is a, an issue of, of a national security weakness, that we can't produce the test kits in the United States of America we can't produce the medical safety supplies uh, in quick time to help us in a situation like this. We're in a similar situation. We have a very limited supply of masks, gloves, gowns, face masks. Uh, we're working with all our health care providers to, to try to share and figure out where we can locate those most effectively. But uh, it's something that I hope is a lesson learned from this, is that before the next thing happens, that we invest in the ability to manufacture those things very quickly. I guess I'm not really reassured. I'm Sorry. Not, so. Commissioner Wilmack. Should have been an accountant or something. <laughs> Good morning, Adam. Good morning. When it comes to coronavirus, this is, coronavirus is not itself actually brand new. It covers different vi <laughs> viruses. What it, can you explain a little more what's unique about this new uh, virus that's under co coronavirus? And for those that might not know that <coughs> the term coronavirus is not something that just came out here in 2020. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question because actually if you look at the back of many disinfectants like Lysol wipes, it'll say in the fine print that this is effective for coronaviruses. So that's been there for a long time. And we've had a number of people with upper respiratory illness, 
go to get tested and the screen comes back positive for coronavirus. And then word gets out that a person has coronavirus. That's why we're really trying to use the, the, the term COVID-19 because the coronavirus is a family of viruses, uh, four of which have been known to us and have been circulating kind of as the common cold for a long, long time, a long time. Uh, there are also other types of coronavirus like SARS and MERS. Uh, this one is, is a member of that family. This is the first time we've seen this particular coronavirus in the human population. It was probably only in bats four or five months ago. Somehow it spilled over from bats into people and here it is. And so the vulnerability that we have is that humans have never been exposed to this. And that's why we're seeing the severe reaction to it. Once this circulates the globe and does its thing, eventually, and hopefully we have vaccine as well and therapeutics, I don't expect this is going to create the same level of human suffering a year or two or three in the future. Thank you very much. And my last question was with the myths that may be out there. Some are so uh, bizarre, I'm not even going to repeat them, but um, there's some myth that certain populations, uh, demographics of communities can't catch uh, this coronavirus, which is ridiculous. But with some of the myths out there and people wanting so much information, those that want information to protect themselves and family, what are some of the things that Kent County Health Department will be doing in just outreach to community and marketing to get some of the great information you gave us today out to the populace because there's even some misinformation in some of the media. But um, you, uh, you definitely uh, have your finger on the pulse of this and how can we as leaders help get your message out? Yeah, so uh, another question, great question, thank you. Um, yeah, we're working overtime. Uh, in, in a major way right now to communicate to the community. And again, to the extent that all of you are, are able, please continue to push our county website and our, our social media presence, especially Facebook. We're trying to, to keep the messages getting out there every day about what the, the real science is. And there's a lot of misinformation. I think that, you know, in, in, the, in the media and just in the culture overall, there's kind of two camps that are both kind of wrong on this. There's the group that's saying, it's not a big deal, it's just the cold. That's not true. And this is really gonna hurt a lot of people, especially the most vulnerable, uh, the, the older population and those with underlying health conditions. They're gonna, they're gonna really get hurt here. And then there's, there's the others who think this is the end of the world and we need to shut down society. And I'm really concerned about that as well because that's gonna hurt a lot of people. And as our economy struggles with this, and low income hourly wage earners struggle with this and struggle to pay the bills. I'm very concerned that that's going to exacerbate our issues with poverty and, and, and the disparity in income. And then we know the correlation between poverty with, uh, with public health as well. So we, we've got some problems on both sides as we're trying to be as reasonable and as evidence based as possible in our response to this. Thank you, Adam. Commissioner Bokowski. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, Speaking of working overtime and knowing how your staff is busy without pandemics, um, is there anything we can do in the sense of, you know, emergency appropriations? Or, I mean, what kind of resources do you need? Or are y'all just tracking that for now? Because, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to be a, you know, the penny wise, pound foolish thing. Yeah, so I, I, I deeply appreciate the, that. And uh, we do have an emerging issues fund within our department uh, that this board has approved in our, uh, our budget. Uh, we are spending out of that right now. Uh, I expect that uh, as this uh, progresses, we may need to move staff like nurses out of programs that have Medicaid revenue, for instance, uh, and that may create a budget issue for us. We're tracking our time very carefully. Uh, I'm hopeful that the money that the state and the federal government is, uh, is allocating is going to be something that we can access and get reimbursement for. Uh, but I, would, I hope that's an open question and we can continue to explore that. And well, of course, I'm working through Wayman's office and I, I know that I have heard from... We had that emergency fund. Yeah, and, 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 and Wayman has also made it very clear that whatever we need, uh, he is going to work with you in, in a, a very uh, quick fashion to make sure that we get it. So, appreciate it. Commissioner Sparks. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, Adam. We really appreciate the daily Facebook messages that you're putting out there. Uh, very important. Um, just some questions for those that are watching. When people say self-quarantine, uh, what does that look like in a family setting? Yeah, so keep in mind that a person in quarantine is not sick. Uh, they're only being isolated because they had some probable exposure to a sick person or they went to an area where there's a high density of sick people. Uh, in a family setting, we don't have a concern uh, about the family staying intact in the same home with a person who's in quarantine. Uh, there has been some suspicion that maybe a person could, uh, could transmit the illness before symptoms develop. It seems less likely, as we learn more about this, that that's the case. If it is the case, the actual effectiveness of spreading the virus before sickness develops is really small. It, it, it's really small. It's once the coughing and the fever starts that then the rate of, of infectivity really increases. Uh, there have been stu some studies that show that uh, even when a family is exposed and living in a house with a sick person, that only about 10% of those in that house will become positive. Uh, now, keeping in mind that an average household uh, has a, a, a wide range of ages and health conditions, so this is a, a good indicator of, of how severe this really is for the older, most vulnerable. Uh, because when we have seen close contact like that in the cruise ships, in the long-term nursing homes, that's where this seems to really dig its claws in and has a hard time uh, getting, uh, getting rid of it. So we're really working hard with our, our long-term nursing care facilities, uh, adult foster care homes, any place where we have people that we know are highly vulnerable to this, that, that's where we want to be. Uh, especially careful. Okay, so how would someone know when if they were well from the coronavirus? How long would that process take? Is there a like 14 days, 10 days, or oh, like after cold? symptoms? Uh, okay, uh, so for a person who right now, for a person who was diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, they would remain in isolation until they have had two consecutive negative tests after symptoms. Okay subside. Uh, however, I, I do think we are getting to a point where we're not going to have a test result on everyone who is sick. And there are be a lot of people who are just mildly ill that are never going to be tested at all. So our advice uh, to anyone is that if you are sick with the symptoms of COVID-19, to, uh, to stay away from work, stay away from social gatherings until you've been symptom-free for 24 hours. And who should they tell if they feel that they have these symptoms, should they go to the hospital? I know that um, over in the UK they say stay home and call 111. So what should we do here? Yeah, so please don't go to the hospital. Uh, you know, they are, they were overburdened before this began with influenza this year. So uh, if, if someone uh, feels like they are in need of medical attention, please call. Call is what they want to do. Um, we, we want to make sure that we're protecting those health care workers and not just showing up because in addition to COVID, there's, like I said, there's influenza and there's a lot of other things going around that we want to protect those health care workers from. Yes. Commissioner Melton. Thank you, Chair. Oops. There we go. Adam, I just uh, truly, it was going to be in my mis miscellaneous. I have, can't tell you how many people outside of Kent County that I have encouraged to listen to your, um, I don't know, are they pro your interviews, your podcast, when you talk, you're very calm, you're very knowledgeable, you bring up data that is important uh, and, and uh, pertinent to what we are talking about. You're very intentional about what you have to say. And at a time when, as you say, I mean, you go to Myers and there's no toilet paper. I don't know about mm -hmm. the toilet paper, and I'm not making fun of those people at all. But the uncertainty can really cause an awful lot of angst, and you truly come across as a voice of reason, as a voice of knowledge, and as a, a very solidly uh, stable source of information and I just absolutely have to thank you so so much um, my sister follows you and she's in the state of Oregon um, I have friends down in Tennessee and they've started following you because you are so solid 
Thank you very, very much. I'm sure you are exhausted. I appreciate your help. Well, uh, thank you. That, that's very generous and kind, but I also would like to say that that is also the byproduct of having an amazing team, uh, and not just at the health department, but here in administration, HR, facilities. There are a number of other departments that are supporting us in this, and we've got a great team here. On the outside, maybe. <laughs> All right, in the interest of Adam's time and, and everyone else's, I would like to entertain anyone, like one more question, preferably someone who hasn't already asked a question. Commissioner Antor. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. <clears throat> you know, the one number that you just cited that's really striking to me, and it's very encouraging as well, is the 10% infection rate of people living in a house with somebody that has it. Uh, I think that speaks volumes. It seems like when people get the normal flu, it tends to cycle through a family. I'm not sure what the differences are, but... 10%, um, that's still an alarming number, you know, given the overall impact of this as far as the deaths. But I love the idea of not panicking over this because we will get through this like we've gotten through every other one previous to this when we thought the sky was falling. And we just pray for those individuals, the vulnerable individuals. And, of course, we always worry about our kids. And I'm so thankful that our kids so far have shown uh, not to be, you know, people that are affected by this, which is, which is fantastic. So, and I, but I really appreciate. I know you're putting in a lot of hours, and this is a moving target, like you indicated. So, but thank you for all your all your work on this. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Adam, so much. Appreciate everything. And I talked to him last night, and he mentioned he has a cot in his office. So, um, I just uh, want to thank him for everything. It's and a team, nice cot, though. It's a team. great office. Is it memory <laughs> foam, or we'll get you whatever? But thank you so much. All right, we are on to item 12, Commissioner Miscellaneous, Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, real quickly, I wanted to give an update on our annual Freedom Cruise. This will be year seven, and Founders Brewing has came on board as a sponsor, and we're going to be doing a 9-11 ceremony um, down in front of Founders in the streets to honor all the fire, police, first responders, and veterans. Um, then we're going to have a concert down there on Friday night. And... Um, I just wanted to have everybody maybe save the date on that because <clears throat> we're going to be following the 9-11 every year from here on in because it seems like an appropriate date. And just a reminder, on 9-11, when all those firefighters and police were running up into the buildings, um, that was incredible, you know, and, and their fate, you know, was pretty much determined at that point for over 3,000 people. And... Um, the soldiers here in West Michigan, we lost a lot of them from Kent County. They couldn't run up into the buildings because they weren't there. But what they did instead is they enlisted to serve. That was their version of running up into the buildings. And I don't know. I, I look forward to the day when we run out of recipients because every year we honor one of those. And this year the honoree will be Richard Harima, who was a Green Beret. He died behind enemy lines in Afghanistan. And we'll be doing a portrait for his family this year. So anyhow, it's a really nice event to, to say thank you. And I hope everybody puts that, you know, 9 is tattooed on your brain. So just remember that day. Come on down and, and help us honor our veterans. Commissioner, thank will you. that be during the day or evening? We're going to be doing a daytime um, honor ceremony. Then the evening we're doing a concert um, with a real special guest. And uh, then the next day we do our Freedom Cruise. Okay. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Bolter. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Steve Curry's presentation to Mac. Uh, remarkable person, and we're lucky to have him at Mac uh, running that. Uh, he presents himself well, but once again, he's just the head of the organization. He doesn't dictate what and what we don't st stand by. And I want, want to reaffirm once again that if you're interested in any Mac committee, all you have to do is call Michael, and we'll get you signed up on that. You don't have to be at the meetings. You can call in. Uh, the only requirement is that you at least make half the meetings. Uh, we're not a partisan group. A lot of people will point that finger at us. We do a couple things to try to ensure that. We divide the state up into six regions. Each region has two, two representatives. Uh, there's also three at-large seats that are set up to try to 
represent the whole state and the people that are in those positions. We have three of those. I am one of the at-large members. Uh, Wayne County, our largest county, has an automatic pick onto the board. So we try to get a good cross blend of the state from Keweenaw all the way down to Monroe and everything in, you know, in between. Uh, the committee structures uh, will take any issue that anybody has. Uh, the two that I sit on, we've already talked about climate change. We had representatives from Enbridge. We also had representatives from Dana Nessel's office. So whenever there's a topic, it's not just one-sided. We look at it at both sides. And just sometimes issues are just too partisan. Instead of getting involved, we tend to just acknowledge that there's an issue and then and then not take a stand on it. I wanted to follow up on uh, Emily's remarks about the NACO conference. I want to thank all the reps. Uh, MAC puts an invitation out to every rep that represents or senator in the state uh, and county people that want to meet with them. We had 60 county officials at that conference uh, that was well attended for a, for a state our size. Uh, local reps that made themselves available, uh, Fred Upton, Bill Heisinger, Justin Amas, Senator Stabenow, and Peterson. I want to <laughs> thank them all because it is a busy time there. Uh, the only couple real takeaways is that a lot's not getting done in Washington, and I asked Senator Stabenow that question of what she thinks can get done by the end of the year, and how is that decided? And, and one thing that struck me is that the Senate will look at 10 issues, and uh, that they think they, they can address or attack. And of that 10, maybe three will make its way through. Uh, one of the things, even though she is working on the mental health and jails issue and trying to make that bipartisan, is that in that top 10 list this year, mental health wasn't even on it. Uh, every time that there's a, you know, a mass gun shooting, we always say we got to increase mental health funding and on and on and on. But it seems to still be an issue that is not taken up on a regular basis by Congress. Keep that in mind when you talk to people about that importance, not at just at the federal level, state and local. And uh, we, we've got to continue to advocate and educate our legislators. And I want to thank everyone that uh, went there. Uh, one of the highlights of it, I did get an invite to uh, uh, go to the British Embassy to meet the British ambassador. Uh, one takeaway from that, uh, he really likes counties that are named after counties in Britain, like Kent County, and he, and he mentioned us. Uh, he's not a big fond, uh, fan of counties that are named after people like Jefferson, Adams, and Washington. So a little British humor. But one takeaway I did take from that, uh, he is the new ambassador. The other one has been uh, removed from that. Uh, one of his charging orders from the new British government is that they want to take uh, time and a lot of effort to get the uh, staff of the embassies out into America, to counties, cities, to build and grow trade relationships. Uh, I offered my card. I told him I'd even make him dinner if he came over. Uh, he's well aware of Michigan. His wife used to and, and him came here. She taught up at Interlochen for a while. So maybe he'll come to Michigan, maybe not, but uh, it's just to keep an eye open that the British government is looking to build on our long-lasting trade relationships. So thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to do a brief shout-out to Commissioner Sawfeld for his lead and thank him for his leadership and his willingness to take on a leadership role of this body. It's a, it, you know, to move into that chairmanship and provide the leadership, uh, it does take a lot of time and it takes a lot out of you. And sometimes... Um, you're almost uh, relieved that it's over, but uh, we do appreciate uh, the the impact you had on our dispatch authority. Uh, I think that's going to be a lasting thing. That was way overdue in this in this county, going down from six uh, primary answering points down to two. So, I thank thank you, Jim, for your leadership, and thank you for your vision, Commissioner Sparks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to say 
you're leaving me too soon. Didn't get a chance to serve very long with you, but I thank you. I remember uh, when I was ill and I got the most lovely card from you. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to tell a secret this morning. Someone's hiding from us on the commission. Uh, they received the Distinguished Service Award from the Kentwood Public Schools. Uh, it was presented by Bill Joseph and the Education Foundation member that is Miss Betsy Melton. That's a really big deal. So I just wanted to make you read and tell everybody about it. <laughs> Thank you for your service in Kentwood, Betsy. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair Bolter. I want to join others uh, as well in, in acknowledging Commissioner Saulfeld and to thank him for his years of service. Uh, many times the public don't realize how much sacrifice goes into serving in that level and uh, uh, almost daily. And so those of us that do serve have a better appreciation, but, but to be in your role as long as you are and doing what you did, uh, we really do appreciate that and acknowledge you. We are a better county because of your service. Commissioner Womack. Yes, I just want to thank Commissioner Jim Shawfield, I feel for his leadership through the good times, through the storms, and with me being on my second turn, spending those first two turns with you, I just want to say, Jim, I know I'm a better commissioner because I served with leadership like yourself. And I wish you continued success wherever you go. I know I will be traveling seeing you on a billboard one day. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, for everything. Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to join others in, in thanking Commissioner Saulfeld. Um, you know, I was pausing this morning thinking about my brief tenure here uh, and the brief tenure that we shared, and um, I, I chuckled because I, I believe the very few disagreements we have had on this board, we've almost always been on the opposite sides of them. Um, but I have uh, always enjoyed uh, even those moments of our debate uh, and our discussion because I uh, certainly uh, see your sincerity behind it, your thoughtfulness behind it. I think even in those disagreements, it's made me a better commissioner. Um, uh, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for that. And also just, again, the, the eight years of service that you've provided to this county. And uh, uh, just enjoy your time in Washtenaw County. And uh, uh, thanks again for your service. Commissioner Hennessy. Thank you. So I will go way back to when we first started working together on the collaboration committee and Supervisor DeVries who would often refer to the big brother and the little sister. And that, and that goes back to when, you know, really the cooperation between us as commissioners and as political parties, we all were working together and talking together. And I think that since then we have, you know, increased that. Um, and, and certainly there are, you know, yeses and there are noes. But I do think that the tone has changed over the years. And um, I, I certainly had fun working with you, especially in those early days on that committee, and um, aligning our values together. It was very good. Any other commissioner miscellaneous today? All right, Commissioner Southall. Thank you, first of all, for all the kind words. I. Uh, was talking earlier talking about those that were here with me from the beginning and missed two of them commissioner Ponstein commissioner Talon I didn't mean to exclude you from that list but uh, I wanted to correct myself on that um, but yes thank you and uh, the only other thing I was going to say is uh, don't let the uh, British ambassador know this but Kent County is actually named after a guy by the name of James Kent who was an attorney, and his claim to fame is that he's the guy that settled the dispute with Ohio where Toledo, Ohio got Toledo, and we got the UP. I think he, he did uh, pretty good in that deal. Yeah. So. I'm taking the Ireland. Uh, <laughs> Ireland. All right, any other miscellaneous? I have a few items, as always. I, uh, I obviously, you know, gushed over Commissioner uh, Southfield earlier, but it was a huge learning experience to me to be his vice chair and to learn from him. And um, I just really appreciate it. And I, I will miss our, our, our chats and all of our 
time together just discussing policy way back to when we were working together on a, in a, at a nonprofit and, and volunteering our time there. So I will really appreciate and miss you and um, wish you the best. Uh, secondly, I want everyone to know after um, we, we, have a, we have an appointments process to fill Jim's seat. We did have an executive committee meeting today. We went through uh, kind of the uh, selection questions that we're going to work on. Um, we are interviewing these candidates on the 11th, um, and we will probably have another uh, executive committee meeting on the 19th to further deliberate. Those are open meetings. If anyone has input, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the 17th and the 19th. Um, so please, if you're interested and you have input, please let, let executive committee members know. Please lean in if you'd like, but um, we do by state law need to get this process going, and so uh, we do have a tight timeline. So I just wanted to fill you in on that. Following Adam's discussion, uh, we did disinfect the boardroom today. We did wipe down surfaces. We did wipe down buttons. I think that was uh, Pam's doing and Al. Uh, door handles were wiped down. You see sanitizing stations. Um, so we'll continue to do that, but I did talk to Linda about if this does become, you know, further, you know, more intense and, 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 and more of a challenge, we do need to discuss what we will be doing for board meetings. Um, and so we are looking into that as well. I uh, want to also echo thanking Adam for all he's done and, and his team and continued and hope I speak for the board when I say we support whatever efforts you need to keep our, our community safe and, and we are backing you 100%. Um, also, we are deciding to postpone the state of the county due to the directives by the governor and some of the CDC uh, best practices. It's just better be safe than sorry, and, and I, though I don't know that this would be super deadly for all of us, it, it could be deadly for some, and we want to be very cautious of that. So we are going to postpone that to a later date. And uh, lastly, I want to also say we have cake in the back for Commissioner Sawfeld, so I hope you can all stay around. And then lastly, I'm so bummed that uh, Commissioner Skaggs is not here to hear this, but I want to congratulate the Lowell Red Arrow wrestling team. I finally get one. <laughs> but it is truly a legacy because they have won seven straight titles, and it's uh, they broke a state record for that. And... Um, the team has a collective GPA of 3.9, so wow. they are not only very athletically talented, but smart. And they have a special 103-pounder kid named Easton Lyons on the team, <laughs> whose mother might be here, and he made the OK White All-Conference. So I wanted to congratulate the Lowell wrestling team. With that, uh, I will call on Commissioner Ponstein for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Commissioner Ponstein, support. support by Commissioner Morgan. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. We are 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 Kent County. We 
Bayya, Kent County. Ami, Kent County. Somos, Kent County. Mas Ira, Kent County. We are 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 Kent County. Oh yeah.